You are listening to Preconceived, where we examine the preconceptions that shape how we view the world and the paradigms by which we live our lives. Hey everybody, I'm Zale Mednick, and welcome to another episode of Preconceived. The relationship between human and non-human animals is a fascinating one. The preconception is that it is totally normal that we cohabitate with other animals in our homes. People love their pets. And for the most part, we assume that our pets love us. But how normal really is the concept of having pets? How did this custom evolve over time? Why is a dog man's best friend in one part of the world, but someone's meal in another part of the world? And ultimately, while pets add much value to human lives, is it really moral to keep pets, especially in the way that we do? Hal Herzog is professor in the psychology department at Western Carolina University. His investigations on the psychology of human-animal relationships have included studies on the moral worlds of cockbiters and animal activists, the use of animals in science, and the impact of pets on human health and happiness. The author of over 100 scientific publications, he has also written for newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Wired, and Time Magazine. Hal, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm really looking forward to this too. I'm, I'm excited. I'm also a bit worried that uh, I might uh, upset some listeners if the end message here is, uh, if, if the take home is something that they don't want to hear about pets, but uh, I, I'm, I'm more so excited <laughs> to delve into this with you. Well, I would hate to upset some of your listeners. Well, you know, it's called preconceived. So sometimes, uh, <laughs> sometimes I hear things I don't want to hear. And sometimes, uh, sometimes other people hear things I don't want to hear, but that we probably should hear or at least should discuss. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding around with you. I guess the first question for me to delve into is, is it normal for humans to have pets? Like, how did this evolve in, in human history and in, in the history of the animal kingdom? Well, okay, well, let's take, those are two different questions. So let's take the uh, first one first. Is it normal to have pets? And uh, it depends completely on where you live. So take, for example, let's take the, uh, probably the most common pet in the United States and Canada, dogs. And uh, we are crazy about dogs. We have amongst the highest uh, per capita uh, rate of dog ownership of any place in the world. There's roughly, in the United States, there's roughly 250 dogs per thousand people. On the other hand, in Saudi Arabia, there's about four dogs per thousand people. And so having a, having a pet, a, a, a dog, is completely normal in Canada and the United States, but would be not normal at all in Saudi Arabia. And to me, that's one of the most interesting things, this idea that humans are natural pet keepers and that everybody all over the world, you know, is gaga over puppies and, and kittens and things like that is just, is just not true. And so that brings up the, uh, the evolutionary question. And for me, and this is something that I've changed my mind about over the years, is, uh, you know, for me, I, I originally thought that uh, pet keeping was a, was a very natural part of human behavior and that we were sort of programmed uh, to love certain types of animals, especially ones that look cute. Uh, and I now don't think so. I, I think that uh, cultural evolution is a much bigger factor in whether or not we love animals and the types of animals we love than biological evolution is. And when you talk about cultural evolution, what do you mean by that? Do you mean the way that like I was going to say culture evolves, which is cultural evolution. Do you mean that in certain parts of the world, depending on how a culture is progressing, certain animals will naturally kind of become a part of that culture? Yeah, that's, so, that's and, exactly. Like, well, that's, that's, that's exactly what I mean. And, and my, uh, my, I'm taking this, uh, these ideas basically based on uh, Richard Dawkins' ideas of a meme, you know, an idea which is itself become a meme. And that is to say, I think now that pets are sort of mental viruses. And I don't mean that uh, in a negative way, but pets are, pets are contagious. We have pets because other people have pets and we're raised around pets. And these contagions can spread very rapidly and different types of pets can spread very rapidly as a social contagion. So for example, um, right now in the United States, we're seeing a, uh, 
a contagion, an epidemic, if you will, of a, a little dog that has all kinds of health problems, but people love them. French bulldogs, they become, from, they become uh, uh, one of the most popular dog breeds in the United States, really within the last 10 or so years. And these are animals that have tons and tons and tons of health problems. Um, so why did they suddenly become popular? Uh, not for a logical reason, because we are simply uh, victims of unconscious victims of fashion. And so the reason why French Bulldogs became popular pets is the same reason that certain types of sneakers will become, uh, you know, become popular, or maybe something like tattoos become popular. And what becomes popular can become unpopular. So the way you're talking about it, it's kind of like an accessory in a way that it becomes popular ooh, that way. Ooh, uh, and I, I, I like that. I like, I like that. Yes, I don't mean to that, be that, connected. That, Maybe I'm misinterpreting, but... Uh, no, no, no. You're interpreting, you're interpreting me correctly. Uh, I, I think that's right. I, 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 basically, what my colleagues and I, we, one of the things that we've studied is why dog breeds get popular and unpopular. And uh, we basically uh, um, have shown by studying changes in popularity of literally millions and millions of dogs um, of, of different breeds that uh, people don't pick dogs based on a rational uh, consideration of their pros and cons and whether they're easy to live with or whether or not the breed's healthy or not. Basically, uh, dogs are basically chosen because of their forms of fashion. So uh, our, our choices in dogs follow the same population dynamics as, as our choices in uh, you know, you know, music genres and uh, hymn lines. Yeah, it's, just, it's pretty interesting. That's very interesting. And I, I will plead ignorance on some of this because I, I, I don't have a pet. Uh, so I, I don't have a dog. So I'm not necessarily in that psyche or have ever had that framework of deciding which dog to get. So maybe I... If I had, I would be less surprised by that notion. But that brings to the question, why do people, aside from that idea of the, uh, the trend, as you kind of called it, mm -hmm. what are the main reasons people do want pets? Because obviously it goes beyond wanting to have, that might influence which type of dog they want, or, or to an extent, as you said, if they want a pet at all. But what are the main drivers of humans wanting to have pets? Well, well, there's a there's a whole slew of things involved in in in, in psychology, and in science generally, we, we talk about at least by the biological sciences, we talk generally about two types of explanations, what are called proximate explanations and ultimate explanations, and proximate explanations are sort of the immediate reasons why we 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 choose something, and for you know for 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 dogs it can be for, for pets it can be things like uh things like the size of their eyes because it makes them look cute um it can be that we're lonely in our life and we want somebody to love and uh it can be because uh in some cases uh, we've seen you've seen newspaper articles and things like that which say that if you get a pet you're going to be less lonely um and the other thing is it what I've always found with the pets that I have is they're fun to have around. So, so being, so being fun is a, is a, is a great reason for having an animal in your life. You know? Now the ultimate reason is different. The ultimate reason is, is how, you know, what are the sort of evolutionary advantages of pet keeping? Mm. And that's been sort of hard to, to, that's been harder to nail down. What, what, what function does it serve in terms of helping us pass down our genes? And is there any function that, I mean, on the surface, it sounds like probably not from an evolutionary standpoint from passing down our genes, but it sounds like there is research into it and I'd be surprised by your answer. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, let's, okay. Let's, let's take an experiment that was a very clever experiment that was done in France. And, uh, and what these researchers did is they, they found a guy, actually they had tryouts for this guy. And they wanted a guy, a young Frenchman that would be very hot, that women would find, find attractive. They actually got a bunch of guys that had women rate these guys on a scale of like, you know, zero to 10 on how hot they were. And they, and they, they selected this guy, Antoine. And so, so Antoine's job, and he was paid for this, as I recall, is he would, he, so. uh, they, they, they had a mall, I think it was outside of Paris. And Antoine's job was to walk up to strange women uh, of dating age 
and asked them, and I'm part of my French, especially in Canada, he would say something like, ah, uh, bonjour, je m'appelle Antoine. I think that means, hello, my name is Antoine. I'm not sure. Canadian and that's all the French I know. French. Um, je m'appelle Antoine. Uh, I, find, I, find, I find you attractive. Um, I'm busy right now, uh, but I wondered if you'd give me your phone number, if we could go out uh, and have a drink late. And so he, he approaches uh, these, these French women, asks them that. Half the, half the times he was by himself, and the other half of the time he had, was with this little mongrel dog. I actually have a picture of the dog named Gwindu. And the, and the researchers hypothesized, went, wanted to know whether or not his hit rate in terms of getting the phone numbers of these women would go up or change if he was with the dog. And when he was by himself, 10% of the women gave him the phone numbers. And he was with the dog, 30% gave him the numbers, gave him their phone numbers. Wow. So, 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 you know, your question is, the evolutionary reason, are women attracted to guys with dogs? Um, well, that study found there was. And, and recently, a researchers at University of uh, Nevada at Las Vegas hooked up with Match.com. And they asked men, had they used pictures of their pets to try and uh, attract women? And they asked women, were you attracted to men that they were more likely to have a pet? And the answer was both cases. The answer was yes. By the way, they also asked, what was the hottest type of, uh, 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 of a pet a guy could own? And the hottest type was a dog. The least hottest type that was rated by zero women was a rabbit. So if you're a guy out there and you're looking for advice of what kind of pet to get, you want to meet women, don't get a rabbit. So, so, Ron, so, I'm, sure so, so to, I'm sure Antoine at the very least made sure he got a dog after that. Uh, that's after right. That. That's it, right. That, you know, that, that, you know, that's right. Now, I'm not convinced that that's enough evidence that uh, petty, you know, pet, you know, pet keeping evolved in, in human life because it, it, it attracted, it attracted, it attracted women. So that leads kind of into a more general question then, though, of are pets good for humans? Uh, and built, baked into that question is the assumption, are some moral assumptions that if pets are good for humans, then we should use them, and we can explore that a bit afterwards, but okay, there is a bit of the- Yeah, let's, let's just, yeah, let's just take the first one. Yeah. First. Are, they, are they good for humans? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say, okay, okay, there's, there's two ways of answering that question. The answer is, you know, do I feel like I'm a better, a better person and I have a better life because I have a pet? In my case, my, my, uh, my pet is a, a rascal of a cat. And I would say, yeah, she's fun to have around. You know, we sit and watch TV together at night. You know, she'll jump in my lap every now and then. Um, I like her because she's sort of a wild animal. She like, looks a little bit like a, a, a wild black panther. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, do I feel like she you know, makes my life a little better? The answer is yes. However, that's not the question you're really interested in. You're interested in whether or not there's actually evidence that uh, you know, we're sort of healthier and happier if we have a pet. And here, uh, I'm sort of an outlier in my field because most, most anthozoologists, which is my field, if you, would, if you talk to them, they'll say the answer is yes. There's overwhelming evidence that, um, that people with pets are healthier and they're happier. Um, and this is exactly what the pet products companies want you to believe. And they are, uh, there's pet products trade groups that say we fund research that will, that demonstrates that pets have a positive impact on human health, human psych, you know, physical and mental health. Well, I th believed that myself for a long time until I wound up writing a book on human animal interactions. And, and I, and I it had a, chapter on pets. So I actually took a deep dive into the impact of pets on health. And what I found was surprising. The evidence that pets are actually, people actually are less depressed or they're less lonely or they live longer because they have a pet is very thin. So for example, uh, the pet products company, uh, pet products companies, uh, take for example, the company Zoedius, which is the world's largest veterinary pharmaceutical company, if you go to their website, they say there's overwhelming evidence that people with pets are less depressed and they're less lonely. And uh, so I took a deep dive and I found 30 studies that looked at depression levels in pet owners and, nine, and non-pet owners. And in five of those studies, the pet owners were less lonely. Mm -hmm. In five of them, they were more lonely. And in 20 of the studies, there was no difference. So the, if you actually look at the research, 
the research does generally does not support, does not provide strong support that getting a pet is going to uh, cut down on your doctor bills. And you know, for example, the, uh, the one of the pet products company trade groups, they claim, they, they, they did a, uh, uh, they hired some economists to do a study on the impact of pets on health savings. And they concluded that uh, pet ownership in the United States saved $12 billion a year in healthcare costs. That's a big claim. That's what they claim, and it's not true. Uh, it was based on the idea that uh, people that walk their dogs, are, are people with dogs walk their dogs more and they're, uh, you know, they're healthier because of that. Data doesn't show that. Um, it was based on a few hand-picked studies and it's just, it's simply not true. Now, you know, it may, it may turn out, it might get, you know, it's very clear to me that pets are good for some people some of the time, but the blanket statement that if you get a pet, you're going to be healthier and happier, that's not true. That's a really important point because it is very widely advertised as you get a pet, you're going to be happier and it's good for your mental health and it's good for your psychology. And like you're saying, there are people listening to this, I'm sure, who say, yeah, I feel like that. But you're not there's a difference between a study and there's a difference between a personal account. And many people might share that personal account, but it sounds like you went through a lot of studies and there really isn't any definitive uh, robust evidence there to suggest that it's necessarily a significant enough on a population level benefit for your health to have a pet. I think, I think you, I think you put that, you put that really well. And you know, some studies have, some studies have found that there's an effect. As I mentioned, five of the studies I found on depression found that there was a positive effect. But, and that's the studies that the, the pet products companies, you know, they all, that's the ones they tell you about. They don't tell you about the ones that found that the pet owners were more depressed or the ones that show no difference, you know? So, and the other thing is, there's also, one of the things that interests me the most is the mismatch between our, there's a mismatch between the publicity that the newspapers and the media and the pet industry, uh, you, know, you, you know, those ideas of pets are good for us. There's a mismatch between, uh, you know, what they say and what the actual research says, which is much more complicated and mixed story. But there's also a mismatch between our personal experience. I personally feel that I'm less lonely if my wife goes away and I have my cat around. I personally feel that way. However, I know, I know what the research says. And there was a wonderful study uh, in, the, in the UK, in, in, in Ireland, rather, and, uh, and Deborah Wells at, at Queen's University, uh, looked at the impact of pet ownership on people that had chronic fatigue syndrome. And she looked at people that had chronic fatigue syndrome uh, that had pets and did not have pets. And all the, all the people with chronic fatigue syndrome in her study that had pets said that their pets had helped with their symptoms and that, and that they weren't suffering as many symptoms as they, as they would have if they didn't have a pet before they had pets. But when she compared them with the actual symptom uh, checklist and the symptom scores of the people that didn't have pets, there was absolutely no difference. So everybody that owned a pet thought their pets were making them better, helping them cope with, with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. But in reality, they were no better off than the people that didn't have a pet. So we, we can't trust, our, I mean, I look out the window and the world looks flat. You know, I go to the beach, the world looks flat. But the evidence suggests that the world is actually round. Who are you going to believe? Your own eyes? Your own lion eyes? It's perceptive. Or what a physicist, what a pointy-headed physicist says. Yeah, but I mean, you could also say that it, maybe there's a placebo effect there on some level. Though I guess the evidence there you're saying was that when she actually looked at the data, there wasn't really even a placebo effect. There was not even a, there was not even a placebo effect. But the placebo effect is very, you're, you're raising a, a very, very important thing. One of, one of the problems with, take for example, uh, pet therapy studies where they bring pets into uh, you know, nursing homes or they bring pets into hospitals and interact with kids. It's not, just, it's not just the therapy dog that goes into the hospital. It's also the, the nice person that's the dog's handler. Mm -hmm. And so it's really difficult to entertain. You've got your, you've got your placebo effect of the, of, the, of the dog. And then you've also got the effect, you've got this really sympathetic, nice person that's bringing the dog in and you're talking to the person and, th and things like that. You know, for, for example, we really see that with dolphin therapy. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to pay the couple thousand bucks a day for dolphin therapy to go swim with dolphins for, you know, um, you know, help with cope depression or, you know, autism or something like that, 
you know, you're, you're at the beach, you know, you're in the sunshine, you're strolling around with these really cool animals. You know, how much is the effect is due to the, oh, you paid a ton of money, so you really have a vested interest in thinking you're getting your money's worth. Um, and, you know, so, so this, it's, very, it's very difficult to do good research in this area because of this placebo effect. And also researcher expectations. Researchers that go into this area want desperately to believe that we go into this area because we love our we love animals we really want to we really want to believe that they're magical magical cures you know so let's say let, let's say how let's well let, i was going to say let's agree that they do have some benefit we don't even need to agree that but sure let, let's let's say that some people view that there is a benefit the next sure. question is okay so there is a benefit for humans but is this moral to have a pet on an ethical level and that's i know such a big question that we can untangle but on a general perspective is it moral the idea that we do have pets okay let's now the, now if you had asked me this question three or four years ago i would have said oh yeah sure every everybody benefits from it I'm, I'm now sort of rethinking that. Now, and granted, I'm a pet lover myself. I've always had a pet and I'm gonna keep having a pet. However, I'm also a meat eater. I'm also a meat eater now. I know the arguments against eating meat, but yet I still do it. So let's just, let's just get our personal things out of here. Let's just I look like at the- I like that you're so down to earth about it. Yes, and, and, it turns, and it turns out what I'm gonna argue is that there's a similarity between owning a pet and eating meat. So you're one you're scratching your head, well, where is this gonna go? Where is this gonna go? So one of, one of the things that we have learned, both from our personal experience and from recent developments in cognitive ethology, especially canine ethology, in other words, canine science, is that, let's, let's talk about dogs, um, is that dogs are amazing. You know, they have mental capacities that um, we never would have thought that they would have had, uh, you know, you know 10, 10 or 15 years ago, since there's been this explosion of, of research in dogs. They can, they can read our emotions, they can read our, in, in some ways, they can, uh, you know, pick up on things in an incredibly, an incredible way. And if you ask most people, and I feel this way, that dogs do have emotions, that they do have the ability to make decisions they do have wants and desires. And what we have done, and 80, by the way, 85% of the dogs on earth do not live in homes. They do not live in human homes. They live, they live around humans, but they're, they're called street dogs or pariah dogs, but they basically call their own shots. So when they want to go out, when they want to go play with their pals, they can go play with their pals. If they find a cute dog that they want to have sex with, they can go have, find a cute dog that they can, they, that they, that they can, ha they can have sex with. Um, they get to eat, you know, whatever they scrounge around, their, their preferences. What we've done when we brought the dogs now into our homes, increasingly what we've done is that we recognize their, their agency. Does that make sense? We've recognized their agency as creatures, as beings. But on the other hand, we, not, we treat them now as prisoners. So your average dog, the first thing we do is we, uh, in male dogs, we cut their balls off. And when people say, when people say yeah, uh, my pet's a member of my family, you know, my, my, pet, my pet's like one of my kids. Like you wouldn't cut the balls off one of your kids, you know? You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, you know, make one of your kids every time you went to go, go outside, you know, for his whole life, you'd put a leash on him. Um, you, we, 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 we don't, on the one hand, we're saying, you know, we're, we're thinking of these as, as, as agents, but on the other hand, we're more and more keeping them as prisoner, as, as a sociologist, Leslie Irvine compares them to as slaves. And, and so the paradox is that the more that we recognize pets as individuals with personalities and with thoughts and desires, the less moral it is to keep them as pets. And that's the similarity. So why do we do them? Why do we keep them as pets? We keep them as pets for the same reason that I eat meat. I eat meat because it tastes good. I don't eat meat because I feel like it. I, I know the arguments against eating meat. I know that I know that it's that that you know I know the moral arguments against it, and I actually agree with all those moral arguments, but I still do it. Well, to me, pet keeping is the same thing. We keep pets because of our needs, not because of the needs of these animals. 
Um, and so to me, increasingly, in increasingly, I'm starting to question the, the ethics of pet ownership. Absolutely. And the meat example is a really, really good one. I'm the same as you, and I just recorded a podcast about veganism where everything that she said to me really registered and it resonated with me. At the end of the day, I'm still probably going to eat meat, even though those reasons registered with me. I'm being, you could call it whatever, selfish on some level. I'm doing it for my own benefit that I like eating meat. And with people with pets, I think you're right in kind of calling a spade a spade. People have pets, not for the, for the most part, I think. I don't want to be too categorical, but for the most part, people have pets because they want a pet for their own well-being or because they like a pet, they find it cute, or uh, because it will help them pick up a, a woman, as we said before. So I think that that's a really important thing to just call, call it as it is. One thing I'm surprised about what you said there, uh, which is, again, my own ignorance, is that 85% of dogs in the world are, are not pets. I guess because we're in North America, a society where it's so common that we have pets, maybe we're disregarding all those other dogs that we're not as exposed to as much. Yeah, well, let, yeah, let me let me let me clarify that a little bit. Uh, some of the some of these eighty five percent, and eighty five percent might be on the high side. Some people would say seventy percent, you know, but, but somewhere in that category. Most of the dogs in the world clearly clearly do not live in a human house. At all the time, and do, and don't and don't have to have a leash on every time they got. Now, so these are these are called street dogs, or they're called pariah dogs, and they and they've been living around humans forever, and they're they're random bred. In other words, so and they typically have take certain forms. So if you go to last year, you know, before you know, last January, a year ago, my wife and I were on the island of Tobago, and one of the things that just uh, intrigued me were the dogs on Tobago. And these dogs live around people. Some of the dogs had names. Some of the dogs, probably most of them wouldn't go into a house, but uh, some of them would, would, but they could probably leave the house whenever they wanted to. They didn't, certainly didn't sleep in, any, in, any, in anyone's bed. And so the question, the, the, and, um, and, and, they, and they, they pretty much called, 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 their own, called their own shots. They spent the day pretty much the way that they wanted to spend their day. So, so the, the question is, if I were born in the next life, would I rather be uh, living in a condo in Toronto or uh, living on the island of Tobago as a street dog? To me, it's a no-brainer. Give me the Tobago street dog life any day. Now, granted, there's a downside to that. Like the infant mortality rate, uh, studies have found that the infant mortality rate of street dogs is typically somewhere around 80, 80 to 90 percent. Hmm. Or if you're living, let's say, in the Mexico City garbage dump, you know, which is a great place for a dog because there's tons of food and, and things like that. Um, but but there's a high infant mortality rate. But on the other hand, if you make it to when you're by by the time you're a year old, you have a pretty good you have a pretty good life. You know, in some ways, a better life than that. Uh, you know, that dog that's living in the in the in the uh, the Toronto the Toronto condo. And I think that comparison that you're suggesting is the crux of it for me. If you're a dog, what would you rather? Would you rather be living with your own kind freely or would you rather have the comforts of that, uh, that nice condo? Probably really tough to study. Are there any studies that have looked at, I don't know if this is possible, but quality of life on some level amongst dogs or maybe is there a way to look at the mood amongst and we're talking about dogs just because that's the most common that we're associated with, but is there any research that has looked at pets that are domesticated versus their counterparts, which have not been domesticated? Uh, I, I'm, that's not an area that I, that I can really address. I'm not, not, and I don't know that. I know there's, well, one of the things that we've done to dogs is that um, we've created all these different breeds. And what we have is these dogs that are, the dog is the most morphologically variable animal on earth. So I just, uh, a, a new dog has just broken the world record for the smallest adult dog. And it's, it weighs less than two pounds. And on the other hand, uh, there are dogs, a bull mastiff will, make, will weigh 200 pounds. So that's the difference in size between me and an African bull elephant. So the, one of the things we've done in an incredibly short period of time is we bred, you know, a dog which is, you know, a couple inches high to a dog that weighs 200, 200 pounds. And their personalities, uh, both between and within breeds, are very variable. So there's some, 
there's some dogs that are, you know, happy and easy to get along with and some breeds that are easy to get along with. And there's some that are just as neurotic, you know, as and yappy and, and miserable it seems to be as their as their uh, as their as their owners. So so I, I think there's so much variation there. It might be hard to hard to tell. Like one thing would be interesting to know. It's, it's a good question. Would be what kind of variation do you see in the in these in street dogs uh, mm -hmm. in terms of their personalities and their behaviors? Um, I don't know. But I don't know the study of. There are dog personality tests that are actually quite good, but I'm not sure that happiness is is one of those uh, a variable on 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 there. One of the questions that troubles me the most when I think about pets: Have you seen the show Handmaid's Tale, or have you read the book? I have not. I haven't read it either. I just I just watched the show. <laughs> but uh, the reason I say that is because in the show um, and in the story, they babies are born and then immediately after they're born they're given to new parents and they're brought up in these great by all objective stances great circumstances uh, by all objective measures they grow up in great circumstances nice houses they're fed well etc and the child doesn't know any different because they were born and immediately they were put in this new family and with dogs at least in the breeding situation or most dogs that are domesticated they're born and then they're pretty quickly taken away from their families, from their mothers and their siblings. And do we know what kind of effect, effect that has? Is, isn't that unnatural to take? Um, that, that's, an that's an interesting question. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a dog behaviorist, mm. uh, but I'll, I'm gonna give this a stab. I won't hold And it. so one of, one of the differences between dogs and wolves has to do with this question. And uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but wolves are good parents. A wolf will stay with his mom for months. I don't know how many months. And they're raised by their moms. Dog mothers, on the other hand, if when in the wild, let's say, for example, the Mexico City garbage dump, they get those kids, they get, they get those pups out as soon as they can. Mm. And so dogs, dogs uh, uh, are typically abandoned by their mothers when they are kicked out of the nest, when they are, gosh, I think somewhere between you know, six, six, seven weeks old. So they don't have a long time of, mom, of, mom, of mama time. Now, what's interesting about this is a study that was recently done by Clive Wynn. And he wondered when dogs were at their cutest, when puppies were at their cutest. And it's not when they're first born. And it's not when they're six months, six months old. It's typically between the time they're six and eight weeks old. That's when they're cutest. And what Clive argues is that the reason why they're at their cutest then is because that's when they are hoping that a human is going to find them attractive and help them make it through this world. So dogs have evolved. One of the things about, about dogs is that dogs basically evolved from wolves because of their ability to, to hang out with humans and have humans sort of, you know, throw them bits of food or, or, or use them as hunters or, what, or whatever. And so Clive argues that the reason why uh, that, 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 if, that if a dog in the Mexico City garbage dump, let's say you have a litter of, of you know, eight or nine puppies, the one, that, the one that's likely to get picked up by you know, some guy that's you know, picking up you know, whatever in, in the garbage dump and finds it attractive, maybe takes it home and gives it some food and stuff like that, that's the one that's gonna be most likely to survive. So Clive argues the reason why dogs are as cute as they are when they're cute as they are is because it's a way they've evolved to trick humans into uh, treating them like their own little children, even if they don't, you know, bring them into their houses, castrate them, and make them make them wear a leash most of the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's kind of an argument also of support for people who are are pro pets, saying at least in the situation of dogs, maybe not the methods in which we domesticate them, but some level of domestication evolutionarily is kind of normal because dogs have always evolved with humans and this is some sort of symbiotic relationship albeit well, I think, I, yes i think that's exactly true and the numbers bear that bear that out 
So right now, so dogs evolve from wolves. Everybody agrees with that. There's some there's disagreement about where that happened and, and what the time frame was. But dogs evolve from, from gray wolves. Right now on this earth, there's about 500,000 gray wolves. There's about a billion dogs. So, so, so the strategy of by a handful of wolves, either in Asia or you know, the Middle East or wherever, the handful of, you know, or whether that happened one place or more than one place or more than one time, the, the handful of, uh, you know, the, the decision of a couple of handful of dogs to sort of, you know, hook their, hook their, uh, their fates up to these, these uh, hairless, hairless creatures um, was actually a good evolutionary strategy. Of course, though, as evolution has changed dogs, humans have also changed. So as you're talking about that condo, we are no longer roaming around and allowing them to live that lifestyle where they can roam around too and be freely. It's Furthermore, for, in, in addition to that, we've also played God in other ways, which has been detrimental to dogs. So take, for example, that French bulldog, um, that little French bulldog that might look so cute, has been bred to have genetic diseases. The thing that makes them cute and partially is because they have these flat faces and their nostrils are, are you know, you know uh, so shortened that they, they, can, they have respiratory problems. Uh, they have skin disorders. They have cardiac disorders. They, uh, we love those wrinkly faces, so we bred them with, so they have dermat, you know, dermatitis. Um, um, so we've actually bred them to look infantile and needy. And so uh, you compare a dog like that to like, you know, your average street dog, you know, one of them looks sort of like a dog is supposed to look and the other one looks like a varying degrees of, of, of human weirdness that, 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 that is um, selected for partially because of the whims of fashion. So we've actually in some ways done some serious harm to the, to the dog genome. So that brings up something actionable, I guess, for the pet owner who says, maybe who's listening to this, who says, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but I still, I still do want a pet. <laughs> or somebody listening might say, yeah, I, I don't want a pet. But if somebody does want a pet, are there certain things we can be doing in the choice of a pet to minimize certain breeds being made or to not support that? Okay, let's, okay. yes, there are, some, there are some things we can do. So one of the things that my colleagues and I have, have studied is uh, why dog breeds get popular and why they fall from popularity. And what we've discovered is a lot of this is due to uh, the whims of fashion, controlled for things, for example, like Disney movies. A breed might suddenly get popular and then suddenly crash, crash from popularity. But interestingly enough, there's been a, uh, so I'm arguing that dog breeds are, in Richard Dawkins' sense, a meme. You know, they, they spread from mind to mind, you know, like, like a, like a you know, mini contagious, mentally contagious, socially contagious. Like a virus, you were saying. Yes, my virus. Now, now every now and then you get these vir mental viruses that are actually good and morally good. And one of the things that I think is this spread really within the last 10 years is the idea that you're a better person if you have a rescue dog rather than a purebred dog. And so, uh, this is partially because of, uh, by campaign, this is probably the most successful campaign by the animal protection movement is to get people to uh, adopt animals from shelters in, in the spay and neuter program. It's got some other ethical problems associated with it, but, but uh, in the 1970s, about 25 million animals were being killed each year in the United States in animal shelters because they were unwanted. Now that, is down to less than 2 million and less than a million dogs. So it's been incredibly successful. And, and that's because they've, they've moralized this idea of, adopt, of adopting a dog. And, and you know, I talk to a lot of people about their pets. You know, I, I'll see people on the street with a dog and I'll walk up to them and say, hey, tell me about your dog, what kind is it and stuff like that. And it's, it's really hilarious. It used, it used to be that people would tell me, oh, she's a purebred lab or a purebred chihuahua or something like that. Now, 90% of the time, you can try this yourself, 90% of the time, if I walk up to a stranger and say, tell me, tell me, tell me about your dog, usually within the first two sentences, they throw in, we adopted her from a shelter, or she's a rescue dog, or she was abused, so, something like that. So on the one hand, we've got uh, 
I think a very positive thing. That's one of the things you can do is you can adopt a dog rather than getting, especially a mixed breed dog, rather than getting a, you know, a, a purebred dog like a French bulldog or you know, something like that. Um, but on the one hand, we've got, we've got people, more and more people doing what I would call the right thing. And then uh, on the other hand, you've got the increasing popularity of animals with, you know, that do have these genetic problems like French bulldogs. I don't want to pick on them too much, but... But yeah, that's uh, so there are these sort of conflicting. We have these conflicting trends. But I guess it is good to see that that awareness of morality is kind of seeped into people's consciousness more. Yes. If they're, if they're yes. kind of bragging on a, about a, a bragging is a good thing. That yeah, well, this dog is a, this dog is a was a shelter yes. dog. I'm, I'm aware of that. And you know, you know, what's interesting about that? One of the things I'm interested in is the is the is a, is the ethics of our relationships with animals and. Um, so if you take a look at a, 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 another moral campaign that started about the same time that the spay and neuter campaign, spay and neuter was, has been an adopt from a shelter. That's been incredibly successful. The other, the other campaign that started about the same time was to get the campaign to stop, get people for, to stop eating meat or even cut down on meat production, uh, meat, meat consumption. That's been a total failure. You know, the, the number of true vegetarians in the United States hasn't, hasn't really budged very much uh, since the 1970s when Peter Singer wrote Animal Liberation. Per capita consumption of uh, animal flesh in the United States remains about 240 pounds per capita uh, per, per year. So the campaign to get people from not eating meat, despite the fact, despite what you hear, despite all those veggie things you see in the store, despite the fact that you can buy a vegetarian Whopper now, Big Mac, um, the campaign to get people to stop eating meat has been a failure. The campaign to get people to adopt rescue dogs has been a success. I don't know why one's failed and why one hasn't. I don't know. <laughs> so we, we've talked a lot about dogs, and it's, it makes sense that we've talked about dogs because they're the most common pets in, in North America, I, I imagine, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, is there, and we've talked about how there is that evolutionary parallel development of humans and dogs over time. So when people hear about how dogs are treated differently in other cultures, do you view that through the lens of, yeah, well, that's just not how a dog is viewed in that culture, if a dog is eaten in that culture, or do you view that like some people might as that's not natural because our relationship with dogs is beyond just culturally different than it is with other animals. There is some, evolutionary connection that we should be respecting? Um, I, I, don't turn, I don't turn to nature for moral values. I think it's a mistake to turn to, to I, I think it's philosophically wrong. Like, like chimpanzees sometimes eat their own children. So we could say that that's natural because it occurs in chimpanzees. Um, we're the only, you know, chimpanzees love to eat meat, our closest relatives. Um, but they, they just, they have no moral compulsion about ripping the arms off a screaming colobus monkey and munching it down. We're the only species that has this, this, this moral sense that we can get beyond what is natural and unnatural. So, so, I'm, so I'm inclined not to turn to, to nature for moral values. One of the things that we know about dogs is that eating dog was extremely common in many, many, many cultures. It's not now. It's found in Asia and it's found in a, it's found in a few places. And even there, um, people are rapidly changing their minds. It's, become, it's becoming, you know, le, you know, le, less less common in some places as people are more and more people are getting pets. Um, but when I look, I guess you know one one of the things that I've learned about studying human animal relationships is that they reveal a lot about human nature. And I was basically trained as an evolutionary psychologist, and I really strongly believed that most, much of our behavior was really determined to some degree, to a, lar a much larger degree than most people thought, by our genes. And my study of pet keeping primarily, and especially uh, the complicated relationships we have with dogs and the variation, has really convinced me that I was for much of my life, I was wrong about that view. And that culture, culture is really the dominant force in human nature. The fact that, you know, in many parts of the world, it's absolutely natural to eat dogs. We kept them around, you know, because they were cute. 
they would help us hunt and stuff like that. But when you got hungry, you know, grab a puppy and throw it in the stew pot. Um, sometimes pets were called, uh, when, when, when Anthony's well, I just called pets the walking larder. You could take dogs around with you. And uh, when times got hard, you know, and you're walking across the Arctic, what you do is you, is, is you, is you eat them. Um, and other cultures, you know, you would never eat a dog not because we love them, but because they're considered disgusting and vermin. So Saudi Arabians, dogs are not eaten in Saudi Arabia and India, not because they're, they're considered cute and lovable and all that stuff. It's because they're, according to the Quran, at least parts of the Quran, they're considered unclean. So eating a dog would be like eating a rat. So even, even, our, even the reasons why we don't eat, eat creatures like dogs is really culturally dependent. You know, the result is the same. You know, the dog's not eaten in the United States because it's loved. It's not eaten in, you know, in Kuwait, in Kuwait because it's, you know, because it's considered absolutely disgusting. You don't, you don't even want to touch one. So I'm, I've become this, this, this realization that our interactions with animals are so culturally variable has really changed my view of human nature. So you used to, if I had been speaking to you 10 years ago, what would maybe be the biggest shift in your perspective? I would probably have said things like, uh, you know, that, that I would probably be, be more impressed by the fact that humans are naturally attracted to puppies by their large, eye, or by their large eyes and, and uh, you know, our need to, uh, that we have an inst a biophilia instinct, you know, Wilson's idea of a biophilia instinct, we're natural, we're, we're natural animal lovers. I think we're natural animal lovers now, but the most natural of our, if there's anything natural about our, our uh, love for animals, it's our desire to eat them. Most people's interactions with animals on a daily basis is sticking a hunk of flesh in their mouth. Yeah, you, there's, so, there's so many points you've brought up that are really interesting. And I think there's obviously a lot of cognitive dissonance in the way we approach animals. Let me, let me, let me argue against that. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make the argument against, but I think most people do not experience cognitive dissonance. I think it's one of the most, when it comes to animals, I think it's one of the most overrated principles there is. I, I, I don't feel much cognitive dissonance about my eating meat. I should, but I don't. And I think if you, okay, let me give it a really good example of this. Study after study after study has shown, or public, public opinion poll after public opinion poll. If you call up people and you say, uh, should, we, should animals be afforded the same rights as human beings? Most people say yes. And at the same time, 95 plus percent of animals, 95 plus percent of people in the United States eat meat. And so on the one hand, most people say they love animals and they should have the same rights as humans and we need to respect their right to live. On the other hand, they, they're not torn up about, about eating meat. Most people are the only people torn up about eating meat are people like vegans that give a lot of thought to this stuff. Most people don't give much thought to it. And I've studied, I've studied this on both sides. Like I've studied, um, I've, my first studies in this area were on cockfighters. And the justifications cockfighters had for uh, fighting roosters, this illegal, brutal sport. Cockfighters had pretty much thought a lot about the ethics of animals. You know, they, you know, they, had, they had thought a lot about it because they had to come up with some sort of justification for it, which they would do. Similarly, I, the study I did after that was on animal rights activists. They had thought a lot about it. So they had experienced cognitive dissonance and in many ways times had changed their lives. But the average person, no, they do, they casually, engage in eating animals without the slightest bit of cognitive dissonance, unless they invite their vegetarian vegan friend over for dinner, which they're increasingly not inclined to do because it makes them feel bad. And then they do have to realize that they're, <laughs> that they're hypocrites. So my, I think my, the way I look at cognitive dissonance, which is not the way you do because you're a professional in this, you're talking about it more as an active thought process where maybe I'm talking about there's a paradox. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's okay. The, no, the, no, the, the paradox, no, to me, that's exactly correct. To me, the, to me, the paradox, you're right on. And I think one of the things that I've learned about my, my whole approach 
to um, studying human animal interactions is how that we live with these paradoxes because they're so blatant and they're everywhere. They're just everywhere. You know, we see them. And to, and to me, this is a source of great um, joy and fun as a psychologist because it's, it's this playground that I, get to, that I get to play in. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, how do, how do how, you know, human beings are just the most, inc we're, we're the smartest creature, but yet we have these weird things in our mentality that just don't make a damn bit of sense. And cognitive dissonance um, is basically refers technically to this idea that, well, when people find out, when you point out that, well, you think that animals should have the same rights as people, but yet you eat them, that people are going to be motivated to change their behavior, to stop eating animals, or to, or to think of animals as being less sentient, which some research has shown that they do. But if you look at the effect size in these studies, which I've done, they're very small. You know, so, you know, showing people a picture of a pig and, you know, having them eat meat, they'll say, yeah, a, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, a pig has gone from like, like a seven to a six in terms of sentience. It's just a little effect, you know? So, so I, th I think most people easily, Homer Simpson once said, and he stole this, he stole this from, uh, I think, Thoreau. He said, uh, or F. Scott, Scott Fitzgerald, he said, um, a sign of intelligence is being able to keep two contradictory ideas in your, inside your head at the same time. <laughs> I, think. I like that. I do too. So, a lot of things I've taken away from this is, it sounds like, I don't think there is a conclusion you come to on this. I, I, there isn't, based on what you're saying. Everybody's going to have their own thoughts, their own morality, their own ideas about all these things we're talking about. But I think you've given a really, really good explanation of some of the things we should at least be aware of when we're, when we're considering the decision of whether or not to have a pet being aware of some of the paradoxes out there. And I think you've done a good job at just calling a spade a spade. Like, are pets good for us? Eh, the evidence might not be as clear as we've convinced ourselves of it. Uh, and maybe there's a lot of arguments that we've convinced ourselves into in order to promote this idea that it is good for us, it's good for the pet, it's good for everybody. And maybe it behooves us, no, no pun intended, maybe, maybe it behooves us to lessen some of those uh, lessen some of those beliefs and just accept the reality that there is some wrongdoing that is probably done to animals in the pet industry, uh, which we, we scratched the surface on. Uh, but you've also provided some ways where maybe if somebody does want to have a pet, they can go about it in a way that might be a bit more ethically sound in their mind. Are there any final messages you would want to leave to somebody who's listening to this? I, there's two branches of ethics. There's what's called uh, proscriptive ethics and descriptive ethics. And proscriptive ethics, basically, it's a, it's, it's a realm of philosophy which tells people what they ought to do. And descriptive ethics is the realm of psychology which tells us what sort of people, what, what they act, we actually do and what they actually think you know, you know, you know, you know, think about ethical issues. And I fall in the latter camp. I'm not in the business of telling people what to do. So the, uh, the only advice that I have to people is that um, you basically only go around once in life. And when it comes to things like meat eating and pet keeping and things like this, uh, these do raise some, some really fascinating and, and in some ways important, important issues. But at some point, we have got to, to acknowledge our inconsistencies and learn to live with them. Complete moral consistency drives you insane, can drive you insane. And I, I don't mean that literally. I shouldn't say drive you insane, but, 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 make, but, but, can, but can make you chronically unhappy, put it, put it that way. Um, and you know, so, so the moral high ground um, you know, has its advantages. But on the other hand, I, I, think, I, I think basically being inconsistent, living with paradox is part of the human condition. I guess that's one of the things that I take out of my study of human animal interactions is that they reveal a lot about human nature. And we're complex creatures. 
and we we've got to make peace with living in the real world and my little my little hunk of you know psychology is just looking at how people do that in their own different ways well that was uh, that was one of the most wise final comments i guess wise final comments i guess has had i absolutely love the way you phrased that about accepting some of the moral inconsistencies accepting the paradox because like you said the world is just too overwhelming sometimes when you're trying to find the moral high ground on everything because it's impossible and at some point i think you got to just say i do my best but i acknowledge i'm never going to be perfect and i acknowledge sometimes i got to just accept that paradox yeah, what's the phrase? Uh, you know, the, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Perfect is the enemy of good. Yep. Well, Hal, where can people learn more about you or uh, find your book? Uh, my book is called uh, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, Why It's So Hard to Think Straight About Animals. And uh, you can buy it in bookstores or Amazon. Um, I write a blog for Psychology Day Today magazine, which I deal with a lot of these issues. And uh, all you have to do is Google uh, Animals and Us. The name of the blog is Animals and Us. If you go to Google, put Animals and Us, it'll pop up. If you stick my name in there, Hal Herzog, it'll pop and up. I will too. put that. I will put that in the episode notes so people can go directly okay. to that. And I'll be sure to. I'll be sure to check that out. Hal, thank you so, so much for spending this time with me. I have really, really enjoyed our conversation and all of the, the great insights you've provided. Well, thanks. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed our conversation too. So everybody, that's uh, Professor Hal Herzig. I'm Zale Mednick. Thanks for listening to another episode of Preconceived. Have a great day.